Hey Logo Geeks, Ian Paget here and we are back with season two. This week we'll be chatting with Marty Neumeyer about strategy and testing your logo. Before we get into the interview, I do want to give a shout out to the sponsor of this podcast, FreshBooks. FreshBooks is a cloud accounting software for creative professionals that's so straightforward to use. You'll save hours every week, leaving time to design logos. To try it out for yourself with a free unrestricted 30 day trial, all you need to do is visit freshbooks.com forward slash logo geek and be sure to enter logo geek in the how did you hear about us section. Guys, we are back for season two of the Logo Geek podcast. Season one was fan- a fantastic experience. Uh, I know when I started it, I was actually uh, pretty nervous and uh, I um, I know I've grown in confidence. So I, I hope to continue to do this. And um, I've had so much fantastic feedback. So thanks to everyone that's been part of that and to everyone also join the Facebook community that's been thriving. So this is the first episode of 10 episodes that will be uh, released weekly for the next couple of months. And they're designed uh, to educate and inspire you on the topic of logo design. So this week, I'm really excited to be chatting with one of my favorite authors, Marty Neumeyer. He's the man behind some incredible books, including Brand Gap, Zag, and Brand Flip, just to name a few. And what I love about these books is that they've been streamlined. These books are pretty thin, and they're designed to be read in in just a couple of hours. And that just means that every single page is jam-packed full of value. I've learned so much from Marta's books and I highly recommend that you get a copy of all of them because if you haven't done it already, I guarantee that you'll learn a hell of a lot and you'll be inspired. So Mart is the Director of Transformation at Liquid Agency and is a thought leader lecturing all over the world. When he's not lecturing or writing, he's f- facilitating inspirational workshops or providing consultancy services to companies the likes of Apple, Google, Microsoft, Skype, and Twitter, which is incredible. You guys are in for a treat. In this episode, we talk about the importance of strategy, and then we deep dive into how to test the logo, which is a topic that I haven't actually read anything about, and I found this uh, fascinating, so I hope you guys will too. So let's get into this interview. I introduce you to Marty Niemeyer. You know, when you're in, in design school or art school or wherever you learn your craft, if you're a designer, um, you hear people talking about concept, right? Um, and students who have concept behind their work, they get sort of uh, more appreciation, right? Oh, that's a good, that's a great concept. Or this guy really works with, with concept. Um, and um, I've always sort of leaned towards that myself. It's like, if you don't have a organizing principle behind your work, it's, it's probably not going to be very clear and simple, unified and so forth. So, um, I was always kind of leaning in that direction, but after working in design for maybe five or 10 years, I started to realize that, you know, there are a lot of great designers out there in terms of styling and, um, aesthetics divorced from any sort of strategy. But uh, just beautiful work, um, and I'm probably never going to be the best at that. Uh, I can compete, but I can't like ever claim that I'm going to be the most do the most beautiful work. Um, and then I started thinking, well, does it even matter if your work is the most beautiful? And and over the years, I found out that no, it, <laughs> for most audiences, unless your audience is a sophisticated, not just a normal, but a sophisticated design audience. Um, you're pretty much giving away a lot of these aesthetics that you think are beautiful and are beautiful. Um, so it's the wrong direction to work in, right? I mean, I, I'm all for gorgeous work. Don't get me wrong. Um, I always try for it myself. But um, what really matters is whether you're uh, getting the job done, whatever that job is. And the job, when you when you peel back all the layers, is a business um, goal of some sort. So if you're not really clear on what the 
business goal of your work is, um, you're going to fail a lot of the time, even if you do beautiful work or interesting work or award-winning work. So, so what I found out after a while is that this idea of concept is good, but in design, the concept, if you're you know, working for a client, the concept is really a strategy. It's like, if I do it this way, I can expect the audience to react in that way. And if you can't clarify that to yourself, then you can't talk to your client about it and you can't get sign off on it except in some other way. You know, you can always browbeat a client into getting them to do something or, or whine and stomp or, you know, walk out or something or just, take, or just take whatever they say and go, okay, well, that's what they want, you know. But if you really want your work to um, be focused and in your control and effective out in the world, then you got to start thinking about strategy. Um, and that's not something I was taught in art school. I went to Art Center in Los Angeles, and it was a pretty practical school, but they just didn't go into business at all. And so anybody who went to these sorts of school schools are sort of in their own little world of the sort of priesthood of design, where um, we all know what's good, but the outside world doesn't seem to appreciate us. And the reason it doesn't is because we aren't actually speaking to the outside world with our work. Um, and that takes uh, maturity and more knowledge than we're taught in school and so forth. And, and if we're always just looking at what other designers are doing and appreciating them and hanging out with them, um, it kind of skews our, our view of what is good in design. We, we, we're just sort of adopting this, this uh, religion of design without, without uh, contributing to it or trying to change it or, or trying to do anything better. We're just trying to be the best of what we've already seen. You see what I mean? It's, it becomes this sort of self-perpetuating cycle. This is very much the reason why I was keen to discuss the role of strategy and logo design with you as in a lot of the online communities, there's quite a few designers, uh, mostly the younger ones who design almost solely based on cosmetics and then they ask for feedback from the wider community. So in these instances, there's generally a lack of context and understanding um, of the business goals or anything. So it's, it's hard to actually give them proper feedback. So my hope with this episode um, with you is that it will inspire them to start to look at design in, in a different way and to start to factor in um, strategy into their work so that they basically be a better uh, designer. So my next question for you is what steps would you recommend designers take when working on uh, logo designs to factor in strategy? Well, I want to be practical with your audience um, and say that not every uh, trademark assignment is worth putting this much effort into it if you're not being paid enough for it. So the things you can do about that are you can build build a system, this system I'm going to describe to you, you can build it in and charge for that and make sure that's part of the price. Or you can just use it when the when it looks like the money's going to be there. But I, but I kind of recommend that if you build this into your way of working, that will actually separate you um, from the other designers and give you a leg up with clients when you describe how you're different, how what you're doing is more objective than what other designers are likely to do. Because that's a that's just a widespread uh, frustration of clients is that designers seem to just do what they want to do and insist that they're correct, um, and so it's all about chemistry. I, if I like the designer, I'll I'll say okay, you know. But if I'm skeptical, I'll just keep questioning, and I'll probably default to my own um, sense of what's good. And and if I'm a client, probably my sense of what's good in logos is not very uh, not very state of the art, right? So what you need to do is uh, um, really be a little more um, thorough. And I learned this over the years, um, you know, just by trial and error and, and borrowing from other fields. But the first thing I like to do is um, uh, research the competition. So you can do this pretty easily by just asking your clients who their top competitors are. You know, who are what are the companies you often um, compete with that? your customers have to decide among a certain set of, you know, uh, 
of choices. What are those choices? And who do you who do you feel? Who do you admire? Who do you compete with? Who do you hate because they're always stealing your customers or your clients? Ask those kind of questions and come up with a list of uh, competitors and go grab their logos. Um, however bad they are, it doesn't matter. You know, we're good. Grab them and put them on a sheet and label them. And um, and then kind of have a little paragraph or a sentence about each one that describes what makes them different and compelling um, in, in the category. So this is um, covered really well in my book, Zag. So the, the, the concept of that book is when everybody zigs, zag. You can't win in a competitive game um, in, in business unless you're different. You have to be different in a compelling way. So I guarantee that every company that is successful has a difference, even if they're not conscious of it. So you just have to figure what that that is. And you also have to do the same thing for the company that you're designing for. So um, so their logo should be up there. And, and, and a little sentence should be under that one uh, saying how they're different and compelling. And the way to get to this um, is to f- fill in the blanks with this very simple sentence. Uh, this brand is the only blank that blanks. <laughs> so fill in those two blanks. So um, you could be talking about a company or a product or whatever, but but this item, this organization, this product is the only something. The something could be let's let's use Harley Davidson, the motorcycle company. The only motorcycle um, in the second blank uh, makes you feel like a modern cowboy. Okay, or whatever you think it is uh, that makes them different and do that for every one of the businesses and you can just go online and find out what they say about themselves and just translate it into that very simple thing that where their onlyness is the thing that makes them different and better um, and then look at the their logos next to that and see if there's any uh, relationship at all and um, often there isn't and those usually aren't very good logos, right? But other times you can say, oh, I can see where this logo would support that differentiation. In any case, you you want your company's logo, the one you're designing, um, to be based either on onlyness, it's, you know, this is what makes us special, or um, the purpose of the company, the sort of vision, but I, I, purpose is a better word, that the purpose that, that that makes them do this instead of any of the millions of things they could be doing. They're doing this company because they believe in it. They want to change the world in, in, in a certain way. So you look at that and you try to draw from that some inspiration for what the logo should be. Um, you know, And this is where the art is. I can't tell you how to do that. There's no linear method. But I think if you're not, if, you're, if your trademark does not reflect those important, uh, essential, um, what would you say, the soul of the company, then it's not going to resonate with, with the client and you're not going to be able to sell it very easily, except as, um, you know, it really looks cool or I love it. We, in our studio, we love it. You know, that's the last thing anybody wants to hear. So, um, you need to have some reasons behind it. So I think start out by doing some research. Now, how long does that take? I don't know. Probably would take me no more than a day, uh, one, one person a day to figure all that stuff out. Um, so that's in the ballpark. And, and then you, then you start sketching and you sketch just like you normally would. You do all kinds of stuff, but you keep checking back to that onlyness or to the vision of the company and, and look at the competition and what you're looking for when you're looking at the competition is uh, ideally your trademark should look pretty different from all the other ones. It shouldn't be like um, uh, an also ran. It shouldn't be like, well, in this industry, they all look like they all have a swoosh. So we need a swoosh. And it shouldn't be like that at all. Um, it should be it should come straight out of the, the essence uh, uh, of the brand. So. Um, Fool around with that. Do you know fifty, eighty, a hundred little doodles, uh, be, and, and so you get some ideas about that, and then you start working those up, and you do your normal, normal thing, and then you get it down to let's say um, six or seven ideas. Um, show those to the client, and don't defend any of them. 
just show them <clears throat> and ask lots of questions. If they ask you, like, why did you do it? You can, you'll have an answer because you've been thinking about this from a strategic standpoint. Um, but just let them react to it and um, ask them, you know, if, if it's possible to get them to like any of these in the first round, you say, give me your, your top two. And we'll take those top two and we'll refine those a bit more and we will test those with uh, members of your potential audience or your clients, you know, or a combination of potential customers and real customers. Um, and they'll say, yeah, well, I really like this one and I really like that. And you may look at that and go, boy, that's just, <laughs> that isn't the one I would pick. But you don't say that. You just say, oh, okay. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to number four here. Um, I know it's not one that you like and maybe you, you hate it. I don't know. But we just have a hunch. You know, we're looking at this from a different perspective. We have a hunch that maybe this one could be the one. So you get your dog in the race basically that way. And you tell them it doesn't matter because we're going to test all these um, because, you know, what we think in this room doesn't matter nearly as much as what customers think. You do want customers, right? Yeah. So we want customers. Okay. So we're going to test this with customers and, and have them read back to us what they think this company is about. And uh, I don't think I've ever had a client say, no, we don't want to test this. We just want to go with the one we want. They all want to know. They all want to know what other people think. So you're going to provide that. And that's not a big deal. And you can get paid for it. Um, it's, 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 in fact, it's the best money your client will ever spend. So, so you, 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 do, you finish up uh, three logos that are fairly, you know, fairly good. They're not totally refined because you're not going to kill yourself on it until you find out which one wins. And you put those into um, a PDF deck or something. And, and you call up, you get a list of, of customers from the client. They'll figure it out. And you ask them to give you a representative cross-section, not, not all the same kind of customer. You know, some potential customers, some good customers, some bad customers, whatever. But you want, um, really, you, gotta, you want at least 20, 25. Um, the more you do, the more credibility it has. But I, I think if you even have 20 responses... Uh, to these logos, you will have enough to talk about with the client, plenty to talk about. Okay, so you, you come up with this deck and you have one logo per page and you uh, call up someone on the list who is agreed by email uh, to render their opinion. And of course, they'll say, well, I'm not an expert. I said, no, that's fine. We don't want experts. We want customers. And uh, we just love your opinion. Thank you for your time. Um, you call them up and you show them these logos one by one pretty quickly. And you say, okay, um, you saw these really quickly, which one of these, um, just caught your interest. So this is really a dumb question. It's not going to matter too much, but it gives you a starting point. Which one cost your, uh, caught your interest is probably the one that looked coolest or looked like something they've already seen and liked or looked professional. It's, it's not going to give you the answer you want, but you never know. So they say, well, I like, I like uh, number one. Number one really caught my eye. You say, okay. So um, looking at number one, what do you think about that company? What do you think it's like? Um, what do you think they're trying to do in the world? What's, what's their difference? Oh, well, I think, you know, they're, they're really big on service. I think service, it just screams service to me or whatever they say. Um, you say, okay, well, what is it about this that says service? I don't know. It's friendly. It's round looking. Um, it looks happy. You know, they'll just read you back a bunch of things. You take notes of all this stuff or you record it. Or better yet, you have the client sitting next to you and listening to the whole thing. Uh, I actually find that really helpful. So there's no translation. They're just sitting there watching you do all this stuff if you can get them to spend the time. Otherwise, you just take notes or record it and let them listen to it. So you, you ask that question. Okay, what do you think this company does? And then then they and then you say, well, actually, it's not about service. That's not their difference. Their difference is the, the product quality is like amazing. It's way beyond. Oh, product quality. Yeah. So knowing that, which one do you think expresses that, that difference um, the best? Well, number three, then. Absolutely. I mean, that says quality to me right away. And then you might ask some other questions like, if it's a product, you say, well, how much do you think you'd pay for a product that had this logo on it? <laughs> and you, go, you know, compared to the competition. Oh, well, I think I'd pay more for that. That's what we're really looking for. It's like uh, that, that 
I, that looks like premium to me. Um, unless the product is a discount product, and then, and then you want to hear, it looks like this one would be the cheapest one and probably a really good value. So you're looking for those kind of answers. You're not looking for which one do you like. That's like the worst question you can ask of anybody about a logo or any any kind of design. And I know we all like to ask that because we're looking for that, you know, affirmation. Uh, please tell me you like it. Please tell me you appreciate all the work I just did on this. But um, you can't do that when you're selling to clients. You have to be really practical and look at it always from the customer's point, point of view. And if you're always trying to do that and you're proving your point as you go, um, what is the client going to say? I, I don't care what the customers think. I like number one. You know, they're not. <laughs> they're really not. Um, so the worst thing to come out of this is uh, customers love logo number three and the client loves no, logo number one. And they just they're like they, they're torn. And then you go back to the drawing board and maybe you ask for more money. You know, you say, well, we solved the problem for customers. So this is more work. And we're going to there's going to be an upcharge for this. So anything you can do along these lines um, to to bring some objectivity to it is great for selling. It, it makes your the value of your work bigger, higher. And also you learn things about what design is that you're not going to learn from other designers or from art school. You're just not. Um, and so this is building your special repertoire of knowledge about uh, what works in the real world. Um, and I think you'll find if you're like me <laughs> uh, and you pay a lot of attention to what other designers are doing, you find that we don't know what we're doing. And we, we, we're always overshooting our audience. We're always giving them something they can't appreciate. And instead of giving something they really get and then giving them whatever we want on top of that. So it could be that, no, we just want to do beautiful work and we know it's not necessary for this particular job, but we're going to give it to you uh, because it's, it's who we are and it's our reputation in our industry and so forth. And that's great, but that's not what's going to make this work in the marketplace. Sometimes it just, it just depends, you know, uh, beauty in the long term always wins out, but in the short term, people don't even notice the difference. And I can give you plenty of examples to show you how little uh, actual people that aren't designers can see in a piece of design. I just want to take a short break to thank FreshBooks who have been kind enough to sponsor this podcast, which has allowed me to make it possible. Now, FreshBooks is an application that makes it really easy to create and send professional looking invoices to make sure that you get paid. There's no need to design anything or format anything, but you can still add your own logo and color scheme too to make sure that your invoices reflect your brand. It was recently redesigned from the ground up too. So the interface looks absolutely um, beautiful. And as a designer, that's something that really matters to me. I can't stand ugly interfaces. If you're listening to this now and you've not yet tried FreshBooks for yourself, now's the time to do it. FreshBooks is offering you a free unrestricted 30-day trial. No need to enter any credit cards. But all you need to do to try that is, is just to visit freshbooks.com forward slash Geek and be sure to enter Logo Geek in the how did you hear about us section. Now let's get back to the interview. There's very little books or information out there on uh, testing other than actually what's in your book, Zag. Uh, so this is uh, fascinating for me. So I have uh, a few further questions. Uh, you mentioned asking 20 people was a good number to ask. Um, how do you go about finding these people? Do you ask the client for a list or do you find like 20 general people who fit within the target audience? Well, I mean, you can do the work for them if they just too busy and you charge for that. You know, you hire someone or you have someone on your staff um, do all that research. And so that, cause that's a bit of work. You have to um, find the people, get their permission or get them to agree to be part of this test. Um, and you don't want to make it really formal, formal or scary. You certainly don't want to pay them. Um, you can, what you should do is give them a gift afterwards, but you shouldn't say, we want to pay you for your opinion. It should be, well, really, we just really would appreciate, you, you know, your opinion on this. We value your opinion as a customer or a potential customer and just 
or just the habit are undying gratitude. Then you give them the gift afterwards. Um, that will make everything good. Uh, and it can be a little gift. It's not necessarily money, just a little something you send. Them. Okay, so the client pays for that, of course. Um, so, yeah, the client should give you the list. Um, then someone has to go through that list and, and, and get people to agree to it. It could be on the client side. It could be you doing it for them. It could be a person you freelancer you hire to set it all up so you can get those um, on the same day, let's say, or within a reasonable amount of time. And then you can ask the client, do you want to be there during these conversations? Um, or do you want me just to, uh, you know, encapsulate it for you and give you the executive overview? But get them to, like, agree that this is the level that they want to be involved. Now, I found in a lot of my testing, clients want to be right there. They're, you know, at least the ones who have some money and are spending good money for this, they'll send somebody to be there. Um, and it just makes it really easy because you do this testing, you turn off the computer and you look at each other and you go, well, what do you think? And, you know, the client will say it's obvious, number three. <laughs> so, um, and as far as numbers of tests, uh, numbers of things to test, I, I, I found that two works really great if you can get it down to two. And, um, and in the case of where the client picks two that you don't like, and you have another one that you really, really, really want to see if it's good. You put that in. It makes the testing a bit harder for people, um, the respondents, to sort through three. Two is really easy for them. It's kind of like when you go to the optometrist to test your eyes, and they put this thing over your eyes, you know, and they put in little slides uh, that put, they put in little lenses that that uh, either improve the sharpness of the type you're looking at or they make it worse. And they say, okay, which is clear, A or B, or one or two? And then they keep sw switching those out because that's the easiest way to get people to compare is just compare two things. So two is best, three is okay. More than that is a lot to ask from anybody. So I wouldn't go there. Um, you can always do more than one test. You can say you can pit the best one of this three against the best one of the other three and do two separate ones. But always keep it simple for the uh, respondent. Otherwise, they get lost, you know. Yeah. And, and it's not about which one's best or which one gets the most points. It's about the feedback you get from people. Because what you're listening for is what they're seeing, what they're getting from it that you didn't know when you were designing. See what I mean? <laughs> this is how you learn um, a lot about people and what they can see. So I, now I want to circle back and uh, give you an example of how little people see when they're looking at stuff. So I used to do a lot of uh, packaging um, in one phase of my career. And our specialty was software packaging. When they used to sell software in stores and you could only buy it in a box. And so someone had to design those boxes and we kind of took over that industry and we were the number one go-to for software packaging. And um, we always tested every package in a store with real customers who were actually shopping in that category. We'd hang around and wait for people to be looking at the category. There'd be a, a mock-up of a box, you know, a prototype sitting on the shelf. And we'd go up to people and ask their, their opinion. Um, and I was working with Kodak back when they were still a viable company. Um, and they were getting into um, software, which they should have really done. And they didn't, so they went out of business. But they were starting to. And... Uh, we had some ideas for a software package, and the only thing we couldn't that they couldn't sign off on was the the typography for the name of the product down at the bottom of the front of the box. Okay, so a big name that could be seen from twenty feet away, and um, I think it was Color Sense. Color Sense was the name of the product. So um, they wanted us to test that in several locations to see if we got the right typeface. So that's the kind of problem that we designers love, right? I mean, like the type is that important that a company is willing to pay for getting it just right, right? <laughs> so, so I said, okay, so the best way to do this is let's just start really basic. Let's just have one version of the box that has Helvetica bold, right? And another version of the box that has Times Roman, right? So we got, we've got old style, we've got sans serif. And we'll just see like which general area we should be looking at. And then we'll go and we'll, we'll refine the typeface. We'll get a really good one that's 
a really good old style or a really good sans serif typeface. Um, and so that's what we did. We took those into the store and we would have people look at these and um, they'd be side by side, the exact same box, just with a different type for the name of the product. And we'd say, okay, take a look at these and tell me which one um, speaks to you. Um, and they would look at number one, number two, look back and forth. They're the same. They'd say they're the same. Everyone said the same thing. There's no difference. Um, okay. Well, look look at the name of the product, and they get you know, take put their glasses on and look at each one. No, uh, it's the same. Look at the style of the lettering on each one, and they there'd be a pause, and they would say, "Oh, oh, oh, oh this one has little feet on it." Okay, so this is before people had fonts and everything, but I'm just telling you as an example. Uh, they couldn't see it. It wasn't important to them. The name was all that was important. The letters, the word, the, that's all that counted. So all this effort we put into these little things, uh, the beauty of the typeface and absolute correct choice. In this instance, you know, with this audience, the general audience, did not matter at all. It's not even part of their consideration for buying the product. They're trying to choose a product. If it's a logo, they're trying to choose a company or they're trying to feel good about a company. So these are the things they're thinking about, not about uh, the exact typeface. So you're kind of off the hook about that. If you like it, if you like the type you're working with, it's going to be fine with them. It's the, what they're looking for is something much different, right? So that's... And how do you learn about those um, differences in customers? You learn by testing over and over again with lots of different ideas until you start to see how different a non-designer looks at design. I'm, I'm really curious because at the beginning of the conversation, you, you made it quite clear that when the money isn't there, you don't necessarily do this. So I'm really curious to know from from you what can be done in those instances where there are smaller budgets because the the audience for this podcast can, can be quite varied you know it can be people that are you know starting out and they, they might have clients that are, you know only have like a, a couple of hundred pounds to spend and it might be you know you get um some agency owners that might be listening as well so the audience does vary so for those that do have those smaller budgets from your perspective when the money isn't there what can we do because obviously like i always want to do a good job and i know everyone listening to this also wants to do a good job and they know that strategy is important is there anything like what what would you do in the instance where there where there is a smaller budget like is is there anything that we can do to kind of factor in strategy in some way um well sure you you can ask those questions of the client or ask them of yourself about the client what is their onlyness you know they're the only somebody that does something and what what's their vision uh for the world what, or what's their vision for customers that's a great place to start nobody asks that question what do you want your customers to become um as a result of working with you or buying your product you know What's the tr what's this tribe? But that's the other way to look at it. What tribe are you trying to create? Uh, customers tend to group in tribes. Um, going going back to Harley Davidson, that's a tribe. You know, that's a really strong tribe with you know, rules and everything about how to behave and how to behave badly. Um, so find out that. Um, spend an hour on that, thinking about that. Talk to the client about it. Just really steep yourself in what makes this. Um, company different and special. Take a look at the the logo, the competition's logo. That doesn't take that much time. Look at look at all of them, and try to figure out how you're going to fit into this in a way that makes it seem like you're in the same category as they are, but you're different in a special way, right? You don't want to like seem like you're an oil company if you're if you're a print shop or something, you know, so, so there, there's just a look to, to each category that you have to kind of pay attention to. It doesn't mean you have to fit in with it or align with it, but know what it is. Um, then you can decide, well, we want ours to not even look anything like those other logos because it's not, the company's not, and we want to make that statement. Um, but often it'll be like, no, it kind of has to look like the industry, but in within that, realm of that what that industry's logos look like ours is going to be different or better in some way better is probably not the right word to give you because better doesn't usually win 
different usually wins. Better is free. Just give that away. Um, people don't know better. I mean, they don't know design. So it's more like, how are you um, signaling to customers that this product, this choice is different and it looks like it could be better for this kind of customer. So think about, you know, the, the vision of the company, the onlyness, the tribe that they're building. What are the people like? What, are, what other things do they like? What other products, logos, companies are they likely to fall in love with so that you can give them something that they'll relate to? And all that's um, something you can do without being scientific, right? It's just putting your head in the right frame. So I would do that. and. And one more thing I would say is if you ever want to get to a stage where you can charge more for logos, start doing this testing thing, build that in, give it away free and get some research or get some, get a portfolio of, of, uh, successful logos built on this so that you can start charging more. And you say, see these logos, they were done with testing. You want testing? (laughs) Of course you do. And eventually you'll say, uh, we don't do anything without testing. That's what makes us different. And that's why you know it's going to work in the marketplace. We're not guessing here. Do you see how that sounds to a client? Yeah, I, I really love the whole testing side of it because that example that you said earlier about the client likes these two, you like this one. But at the end of the day, neither of you actually know what the real situation is. No, and you're really just testing. It's not until you actually start testing it that that you see. Um, and like like I said, I haven't actually been able to find much information about um, testing uh, Legos or branding other than what is in your Zag book. So it's really interesting. I'm the only one, the only one that does this. Um, why? I don't know. Um, because there, there are companies that do a lot of testing of logos and stuff and TV commercials and ad campaigns, but they're just not designers. You know, they... They test for things like you, you don't even know what to do with the information they bring back. It just doesn't make any sense to you. So what you want is a feedback that can influence how you're designing it. Like it has to be, you have to understand from your point of view, what they're saying so that you can do something with it. So you can't just like have a, a third party company test something and give you these because it's just going to lead you in the wrong direction. You'll, you'll, you'll maybe follow the advice you're getting from the testing and it'll just be awful, awful, terrible logo, you know, so, you know, keep control of it. So I'm, I'm just thinking as a uh, cheaper option, would it work if you was to collect the feedback using um, online surveys such as SurveyMonkey? You know, I don't because um, you'll get sort of stock answers that you won't be able to interpret. So let, let me go a little bit further with this. When you get an answer, when you say, okay, what, what do you think this um, company does? Oh, I think they're, um, uh, they sell shoes online. That's what I think. Oh, well, actually, no. They, um, they customize shoes. Uh, they have stores, and sometimes they do it online, but um, you can get it online, but they, they make custom shoes. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Um, you know, and you start, you, you can probe, okay? You're like a detective. You're asking questions. You just you keep asking. You never defend the work. That's that's one of the rules. You never say no. You don't understand what I was trying to say with this logo. <laughs> you never say. <laughs> you you just keep asking like they're the most interesting person in the world, and and, and they are in that moment. Um, you, you know, tell me what you're getting from this. Um, did you notice how this uh, the letter E here is curved in this sort of unusual way? Does that mean anything to you? I mean, did you notice that? You can ask all kinds of questions. Um, and one, one answer leads to another question. So if you're doing that on SurveyMonkey, you're going to get these very stiff answers. And maybe you can use that to prove something to a client. But I, I think it's more valuable as you, for you as a designer to be hearing these things and to adjust your view of customers and learn sort of rich information about customers that you can keep using your whole career and, and get paid for it by the client because... Um, Eventually, if you get good at this, you'll be charging, you know, twenty thousand, fifty thousand dollars for a logo. If you get a whole company uh, that's aligned behind this idea of great logos, I mean that that's the price range um, that that the big companies pay, and 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 even up into a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, if it's a huge company. But let's not even bother about that. <laughs> that's like I've never gotten that much money. But I have in my career, I've gotten plenty of times where I've made between ten and 30000 just for a logo. 
but but only when I got a reputation for it and and I could do it this well, right? I mean, this is a lifelong pursuit. Well, I think each time that you're actually testing something, you're learning from that information as well. So what you actually, like after several years of doing this, what you do actually put out is probably going to actually be right from the outset. So I find that fascinating testing. I, I, I need to try that myself. Yeah, I recommend it. Um, I think you get better at it. I think what you do is you get humble. You start to like think of like, how could I be thinking about this wrong? And I don't know if that ever goes away. I'm always thinking about things wrong. I think I, the first thing I ever do in any assignment is do something wrong. I just, I'm convinced. It's like, you know, if I go to a hotel and um, I find my room, number 418, and I go in, uh, I, when I come out in the morning, I always turn the wrong way and the elevator is the other way. Because I, I don't know why. It's just, I did, that's just me. I just do everything wrong to begin with. So, um I'm just going to assume that in everything I do from now on, that I'm wrong. I don't know how, um, but I'm going to find out. Uh, I have plenty more ideas if that one doesn't work. <laughs> if I don't turn right, it must be left, you know. Um, and I think maybe other designers have the same feeling, like you're designing something and you're putting one thing in the upper right-hand corner and you put something else in the lower-hand corner and it has this dynamic diagonal quality and then you realize it really should be the other way around that thing should be over there and that thing you know you just had it swapped left or right um those are kinds of things you find out all the time um and so it pays not to just you know believe your own press clippings you know just like really be humble try different things see if it works just keep your mind open as much as possible for, for as long as possible keep your work in a liquid state a little bit longer than you might want to um, uh, and I'm not sure this is good advice for everybody to keep things in a liquid state because there's some people that can't finish things. <laughs> so those people don't have a problem. They need to learn how to finish things. But if you're the kind of person that likes to just barrel ahead and get your way and get this thing done, get a sign off, then maybe you need to also cultivate this um, ability to, to, to keep an open mind as you're working and always think that maybe a little something could be changed, something could be better. I need to find out how I'm doing. And then maybe I go back to it. Um, See what I mean? So everybody has a different. Okay. I want to change the topic slightly. Um, so we recently had the F1 logo uh, released and um, the company simply published a video announcing the new logo. And um, there was very little uh, context uh, or any explanation as to the reason for the change. Because of that, uh, there was quite a lot of uh, negative backlash uh, to the logo, um, which is something that, that's fairly common with uh, any logo change. But with the F1 logo, it was quite a uh, negative. So I'm curious to know from you, what would you say is the best way to announce a new logo to the general public? Uh, you know, I always think of identities as not being a news item for people, for customers. It is for the company, and it certainly is for the designer, and it's great to say this is the new us, and it just really feels great to do that. But it seems a little self-referential, a little bit inward-looking, like, um, you know, is it really about that? Is the brand really about what people think of the logo? Is that, is that it? Uh, I, think, I think what you do is you, you use the logo, you put it on things, and you just put it out there, and then you explain it to people who care. Um, separately, right? But you don't make that the focus of a change to a brand because it raises a lot of questions. Like, why do you care so much about this? What does it have to do with me, the customer? Um, now I have to learn another symbol that I didn't, you know, have to before. Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> kind of thing. Um, now, if there's a story behind the change, then you have to tell that story, but you shouldn't tell it just with a logo and just say, we have a new logo because we're really different. You, 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 you prove it in other ways, not just like a, with a symbol, you prove it with the real stuff. Here are the things we're doing that is different. And, um, oh, by the way, here's, here's how we're symbolizing it from now on. This is the new logo. Um, you see that a lot, you know, people like splashy new logos. I think Uber did that and they got their new logo. It's just, it's just unintelligible um you know why do that i mean it's 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 really about 
what the customer gets from this company and the logo isn't what they're buying. So Apple would never, for example, say, this is our new logo. Look at the change we made to it. They just never would. Even Steve Jobs wouldn't do that. Um, he would just put it there. You know, this is it. So that's my feeling about that. And there may be exceptions, but you're totally right. And uh, I understand uh, it makes sense why, um, when companies do make a big deal out of it, they, it does cause so much upset. Yeah, I mean, so, and I think when you do change something about a, a beloved brand, like you change the logo, people are going to be upset. Some people are just because you changed it and they liked it. So um, you have to explain it, but it, it shouldn't be front and center. It should just be there for people who want to look, what, what's with the new logo, you know, and they, they Google that. And, and then there's a little article that explains why they did it. Um, and maybe a little story about the designers, um, and maybe the admission that, you know, not everybody's going to like this, but we think over time, you'll appreciate that this is actually a better fit. Let's, let's just keep an open mind <laughs> and we'll see. Um, or, or just direct your attention to like all the cool things you're doing as a company. That would be the best thing. And just say, this is, um, we think this is a better representation of what we're doing. Um, and in time, all these things work out. So that's the thing you have to understand about logos. Um, Paul Rand, the great Paul Rand, uh, who designed the IBM logo and many others, CB, not, not CBS, but a few other great ones, um, always said that it's what makes a great logo is the company. If the company is great, the logo looks great to all the customers. Even if it's badly designed, it'll look great. There's very little that a designer can do to to change someone's mind about a company um, if it's not really there. It has to be there. So I thought that was, a, for a guy who wasn't very humble, that was a very humble uh, thing to say and probably really true. So, and by the same token, if you change a logo and you get a lot of upset people, well, that goes away too. And eventually if the company's good, they like the new logo. So, you know, you know, there are plenty of advantages to having a perfect, great logo. Uh, but it's not everything. It's just, um, it's a piece. It's an important piece. It's a symbol of a lot of other things. And you have to align your symbol with what's actually going on and show the company in its, in its Sunday best, really. Um, and not everyone can do that. It's a great skill to have. But um, let's not overplay it. Okay, so I have one more question for you. If you could just give one Lego design tip to the audience, what would that be? Um, I think like drive for the most simple expression you can uh, while you're working on it. And it, it may not call for something simple, but um, when you strive for simplicity, especially in a logo where it actually pays off really well, um, you can see if you're lying or not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if it's really simple. You can see like, is this really what we want to say? Is this who we are? The more complicated you make it, the more room there is to hide behind it. Right. Um, as it starts to approach something like a, a seal or, you know, an illustration or something, it starts to become something else. Um, uh, logos have to be usable in lots of forms. So I'm, I typically would, do a logo it had, that has a very simple quality, like a very flat two-dimensional quality for when something has to be printed very small. But most of the, most logos aren't printed anymore. They can be three-dimensional. They can be uh, avatars. You know, they can move. And they can do a lot of stuff. Um, and and the, the one logo could do all that if it's just rendered in different forms. And I think that's fun. And the other thing is that... Um, a logo doesn't have to be one logo. You can, a company could have five different versions of the logo, and it's, as long as it says the same thing, that could be a solution, right? And you see that uh, from time to time. But, but I always start with simplicity. If it doesn't work in its simplest form, maybe it's just not right. Um, you can always make it more detailed later. But, um, I just think the old way is the best. Uh, sketch it, do it really simple, and it's simple, and if it's not killing it at that stage of simplicity making it more complex or, or three-dimensional is not going to do a lot for it that's great final words of wisdom marty thank you so much for your time um i really appreciate it and i'm sure the listeners will do too so thank you so much for your time oh, thank you. well that was such a fantastic episode what a great start to the new season 
thank you, Marty, for being such a fantastic guest, for sharing so much value and for allowing the community to learn more from you. Now, this is the uh, first of a 10 part season two. So make sure that you subscribe um, on iTunes so that you can hear each episode the moment they come out. Now, if you want to chat about this episode with other logo designers, or in fact, anything to do with logo design, you need to be in the Logo Geek community on Facebook. It's completely free. It is um, it's carefully moderated. So it's just full of, you know, uh, fantastic people. Uh, and it's, you know, Know, it's a thriving community and that's grown very quickly. It was something that I started only about six months ago and here today releasing this episode is at over 2,500, which is absolutely incredible. To find out, just visit logogeek.uk forward slash community. Show notes for this episode can be found at logogeek.uk forward slash 2.1. Now, thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, as I said, make sure that you do subscribe. And if you want to give a little extra support, I'd really appreciate a uh, rating and review on iTunes as well. So for now, I'll see you next time.